The objective today is to explain what the Intel manual says about x87 instructions. First, let's talk about this last little section from before. It's 5.1.16.1, and it's titled Detection of VEX Encoded GPR Instructions. So this part in particular would be ridiculous to read to you, so I'll just try to do an abbreviated version here. It says VEX encoded general purpose instructions do not operate on any vector registers. So a simple question, what type of instructions won't operate on vector registers? Those are going to be the VEX encoded general purpose instructions. Now things are going to start getting crazy in the manual when it talks about VEX and SSE. There's a lot of resources out there. There's even a blog I read from and I made a video of as well. Just to try to help everyone wrap their mind around what Intel is doing. But there's been a bit of an instruction set wars for the past 20, maybe 30 years. And we're about to start reading about it. I just want to try to keep all that drama away and just kind of focus on the Intel manual. So the next part reads, there are separate feature flags for the following subsets of instructions that operate on general purpose registers and the detection requirements for har hardware support are, and they'll finish the entire section with a bunch of CPU ID values you can put in to see what your processor supports. So I won't say anything more about that section. If you need to learn more about CPU ID, on Stack Overflow, I wrote up a pretty, I think, a good explanation of how you can use it to learn more about your processor. I put in some code, a diagram, a quote, and a link to a, a website called felixcloudtier.com, which I found to be a really great resource. So as we leave that section, let's ask this question, what can the CPU ID instruction tell you? And basically it can tell you all the features your processor supports. Then you'll know what instructions at the low level you would be allowed to use. And I've even seen information on temperature come back through that command. But let's focus on the manual. Here we go, we've made it to the x87 FPU instruction section. This is chapter five, section two, or part two. They read the x87 FPU instructions are executed by the processor's FPU. Now, these instructions operate on floating point, integer, and binary coded decimal operands. For more detail on the FPU instructions, see chapter eight, programming with the x87 FPU. And so if there's one memorable tidbit I can give you uh, about that paragraph, I just thought it was interesting. I talked to a programmer who absolutely hates floats and working with floating points, um, but there's BCDs all over his code. So I like to poke fun at him and let him know the FPU is handling those, even though the FPU is probably most famous for working on floating points. Now, similar to before, um, these instructions are also divided into subgroups and similar subgroups. Uh, we have data transfer, load constants, and FPU control instructions. And now we're going to quickly read through the subgroups, but since I've already read through the subgroups for the basic x86 instructions, I'm going to really skip over a lot here. I'll try to just draw your attention to particular instructions that stand out to me. And of course, I'll read like the first sentence or two in each of the sections. So here on the data transfer section, it says that these instructions move floating point integers and BCD values between memory and the FPU registers. They also perform conditional move operations on floating point operands. So our first example of an instruction is FLD, and the description is it loads floating point values and I just over here wrote a floating load. If you can remember that, you can remember what FLT stands for. Next up we have FST, store floating point value, or if you wanna strictly go with the mnemonic, it's floating store. For those looking at the video, they could see how Intel is just emphasizing the uh, consonants of certain words to create the instruction in the first place. Now the next one is FSTP, store floating point value and pop. Then we have three similar ones in a row. We got load inter integer, store integer, and store integer and pop. So in terms of our integer section, <laughs> F-I-L-D, F-I-S-T, fist, as in floating integer store, and then F-I-S-T-P, 
Moving on to our BCD instructions, we got FBLD, load BCD is what that stands for. Oh man, so many acronyms. Uh, remember BCD is binary coded decimal, and that is a funky data type. I think I remember reading Intel might have even gotten rid of it. And in terms of data transfer instructions, there's only two of them. So there's that one, load BCD, and then the next one is store BCD and pop. Now FXCH is the exchange registers. It's interesting, I don't know how that's an instruction. It seems to be just a thing. Unless it's implying that you're going to do an exchange error. Okay, that's probably what it is. And now to finish off our data transfer instructions, we have all these floating point conditional moves. So same as before, uh, move if there's something equal, move if not equal, uh, we got below, below or equal, and so on. I guess the last two are kind of unique. It says uh, conditional move if unordered and conditional move if, if not unordered. There's a double negative there. So for a question, what two instructions stand out to you in the x87 data transfer section? I guess um, one thing I could say would be like the integers kind of stood out to me because I find it interesting that those are not being worked on um, on the x86 chip. I had just for some reason imagined if we're over here on the x87 chip and we're working with floating points, even if we have an integer, we can make the integer a floating point. It would just be a point zero zero all the way down. But I find it interesting. We have ourselves some integer instructions over here. All right, so now things are going to get really speedy. Um, x87 FPU basic arithmetic. Uh, arithmetic instructions and these perform basic arithmetic operations there we go said it way better the second time around well we got our basic operations over here um, on floating point and integer operands so I'm just gonna scroll down really quickly we can add floating points we can subtract floating points while doing so we can pop and reverse them apparently we can multiply integers and floating points. We can divide them. Now here's some uniqueness down here. Um, FPREM is a partial remainder operation or instruction. Now this really unique one um, confuses me. We have ourselves uh, FPREM1. That's an IEEE partial remainder. I'll have to look that up later. We have an instruction for absolute value here. We have an instruction to change the sign of something. We can round to integer, scale by the power of 2. We can square root, and then extract exponent and significand. So I'm going to go with my favorite instruction here. Um, what does FSQRT stand for? And we're going to go floating point square root. All right, now we got a bunch of comparison instructions. We can compare floating points, then we can compare them and pop. We could pop twice, have an unordered compare floating point, an unordered compare floating point and pop, again with an instruction to pop twice. So I guess you could say we've learned about popping twice, twice. Once in an unordered context, another in a regular floating point context. Well, F-I-C-O-M, F-V-C-O-M. Floating integer compare, um, well, we could compare integers. We can compare integers and pop. We can compare floating point and set E flags. We can have an unordered compare floating point and set E flags. And this one looks like the mama of them all. F-C-O-M-I-P, F-C-O-M-I-P. This is compare floating point, set E flags, and pop. Okay, so what does FCOMIP stand for? That's floating point compare I for E flags, I guess, and then P for pop. And its sister instruction is hilarious, actually. So if I wanted to do an unordered compare floating point set E flags and pop, I would use the instruction FUCOMIP. So FU to do an unordered compare. Our last two here is a test floating point, so you can compare it with zero, and then examine floating point. We're almost done here, we have one more page. So 5.2.4 is all about transcendental instructions. That's just a cool word. These transcendental instructions perform basic trigonometric and logarithmic operations on floating point operands. So F sin to do a sign, 
F cos to do cosine. You can do F sin cos together for sine and cos cosine. You have a partial tangent instruction here, a partial arctangent. Arctangent? I've never heard of that before in my life. Next up is an instruction to do 2 to the x minus 1, and then we have two logarithm instructions to finish this transcendental instruction section off. Next up is the load constants instructions, and those are pretty straightforward actually. So FLD1 is load the value of 1, of course in a floating point format, and then FLDZ for load 0, you have FLD pi to literally load pi, as in 3.14, all the way till I imagine the uh, limit for that number is reached in this IEEE 754 standard. And what can I say about pi? That's just like the Mr. Popular of all the mathematical values out there in the world. And the last four load constant instructions all are related to logarithm ones. Alright, so two things here. First, what were the transcendental instructions relating to? And the second direction is just give me one example of a load constant instruction. I am sure most people out there will be doing FLD pi, floating load pi. Well, here we are, the end of this video, and then next time we'll go over x87 FPU and SIMD state management instructions, but this will be good enough to finish our day off. We have a bunch of uh, control instructions, and as you can see here, these operate on the x87 FPU register stack and save and restore the x87 FPU state. So as we go down the list here, a lot of these are just in pairs. So we got in increment the FPU register stack pointer and then decrement that same pointer. We have something called free floating point register. F free is the instruction there. Next up, we have a scenario where you initialize the FPU after checking error conditions, and then initialize the FPU without checking for the error, error conditions. After that, clear floating point exception flags after checking for error conditions, or the exact opposite. You're still clearing the floating point exception flags, but this time you're not checking for any errors. Then we have store the FPU control word, first checking for errors, and then store the control word without checking for errors. We have load the FPU control word. That one's just kind of like out there on his own there, FLDCW. Yeah, CW often stands for control word. But having that guy all alone like that is kind of like the one down here. So we have a situation where we're going to store the FPU environment after checking for those error conditions. Then the same thing without checking for error conditions, followed by just a simple load the FPU environment. So my question is, what does Intel mean by FPU environment? And I should write that other question down too. What does CW often stand for? Well, F save probably look familiar to you, and you're about to see it in the very beginning of the next um, video as well. But F save stands for save FPU state after checking for error conditions, or you could save the state after or without checking the error conditions. So the pattern here is N. It's always N after an F. N for like no check the errors. Well, you're able to restore the FPU state, you're able to store the FPU status word, either after checking for errors or without checking for them at all. And then our last two, we could wait for the FPU. That instruction is gonna be very hard to memorize. It's W-A-I-T. And our last one for the day, F-N-O-P, as in FPU no operation. Well, that's it. We blew through the entire x87 instructions in just one single video, and the next time we'll go ahead and start talking about SIMD stuff. Thank you, as always, for watching.